Hi, this is Shayla with Whole Motherhood, and you are listening to Moms Learning with Moms. This YouTube channel is just an effort to have different experiences shared from real people who have had these experiences. Some of the best things that I've learned in motherhood is that I learn best when I talk to people. And so just give us a like if you like that and follow us if you start liking this kind of content and give us feedback of what is interesting to you. All right, so I have my friend Melissa here. She has about eight children, not about, she has eight children <laughs> and has had postpartum, um, several of them. And we are going to start Let her tell us about her family and her children. And then we'll go from there. <clears throat> so like Shayla said, I have eight children. Um, been married 23 years and we had our first six pretty close together. Um, our sixth baby was born when our oldest, right before she turned eight. And so they're pretty close together. They don't average two years apart. <laughs> I have several 16 month apart gaps, um, <clears throat> 19 months apart. And we had a five, five and a half year gap. And then we had two more close together, um, 15 months apart. And so I don't know, I had postpartum depression with my first, but didn't recognize it as that. Um, and then with my fourth, and then with my, I think a little bit with my sixth, but not, not too bad. And then with my um, seventh and eighth, for sure. So as you have gone through the postpartum, it was on your fourth that you recognized that you had postpartum? Yeah. So what were the kind of the signs of, <clears throat> of that? Well, I don't know that I recognized the signs. I went to my six week appointment and my doctor recognized it. I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm probably going to be emotional during this. Um, it's a, it's a tough topic and it's tough to think back on really, but um, I don't think I did recognize. I knew I was having a hard time, but I had had a hard time before with Adeline and um my six week appointment, my doctor just said, I don't think you're okay. And I think we need to get you on medicine. And I think just having someone acknowledge that, that I wasn't okay. And that it wasn't me saying it, but it was someone else saying it. And it was a doctor that I trusted. I was able to say, okay, you know, okay, let's, let's do something. How did it. you recognize that Melissa? What were some things that you told with that appointment <laughs> or were you just crying during that appointment? Was that... I was definitely crying during that appointment. They asked how I was, you know, the, the question that always, <laughs> if you're at church and not doing okay, you do not want someone asking you how you're doing. Um, but they asked how I was. And I remember like inside thinking not great, but on the outside saying, you know, oh, I'm doing fine. And I'm sure I wasn't convincing at all. Um, and how I said it, I, he probably asked me a few other questions. He didn't just jump straight to, you know, you have postpartum, but um, he probably asked some more probing questions. I don't remember that part. I only remember that the feelings of when he said, you know, how are you doing? And, and the relief hearing him say, you know, that there's something, I, this wasn't just normal, that there was something going on that we could, we could try to help do something about. So what kind of, um, once you got on the medication with your fourth, like what were the feeling changes? Not knowing anything about it and completely just trusting my doctor. Um, he put me on Zoloft, which is supposedly a good starting drug. And it probably is for a lot of people. It was not good for me, but I didn't know that I could ask for something different. I didn't know that I could, you know, go in after a couple of weeks after you have to have a couple of weeks for the medication to sort of settle in and for you to figure out how it will affect you. Um, I didn't know that if I didn't like <laughs> what was happening that I could say something about it. Um, so I was on that medication for about um, six weeks and it didn't have great side effects for me. Mm. It, it did help me not have really low lows which to me was like, okay, this is doing what it's supposed to be doing. But I didn't know that, um, that being on medication, it doesn't have to completely flat, flat line you, which is what it did for me. Mm. That first one did at least. So I didn't have low lows, but I also didn't just experience life, basic joy, life, 
I really didn't, my children would, you know, tell me about something or show me something they'd done. And I knew I was supposed to be feeling, you know, happiness, pride at their new accomplishment or something. And I mostly just, I just didn't feel other negative side effects for me on Zoloft specifically was, um, so I didn't have extreme lows, which we can talk about in a minute. Um, I also, I had zero libido, no desire for intimacy with my husband, which when you're experiencing depression, <laughs> it's lonely already and adding to it, you know, no desire for any kind of intimacy. And again, no, it's not that I didn't love my children, but I wasn't feeling all the things you should feel about having a family. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't really feel satisfaction for anything. I could, I was just going about life and I was just in a very flat line um, manner, which didn't feel like life, you know, you kind of lost the purpose of, of life, but I was able to go. It did help with that. I was able to, if there was an activity or something, whereas before, again, jumping around a little bit, because we haven't talked kind of what my what kinds of things I felt before, but after I was on the medication, I was at least able to go out of the house, go to the things that I was, um, that I needed to go to or wanted to go to. Well, let's pause for a second and then jump back to your first one. What were the experiences with that without realizing what was happening? It was a lot of, I mean, the, the main feeling was just that I'm a woman and I have a capacity to give birth to a baby, I should automatically know what to do with that baby. And I should have certain feelings of joy and I should know instinctively how to be a mom. Mm. And um, I didn't, I mean, I had a bit, I grew up in a big family. I had younger siblings. As a matter of fact, I had a baby sister that was born when I was 18. So as far as like, knowing how to basically care for a baby. I just knew that I knew how to do that. I was going to be a good mom. And so the depression really, it confused me. I knew how to take care of the baby, but I didn't understand all the other feelings. I just assumed that I, after all, was not a good mom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, after all, even though thinking I was going to be a good mom, I just, I just wasn't. And I don't remember, I, I do remember with Adlin, that wasn't like strong from the, Adlin's my firstborn. It wasn't strong from the beginning. It was more, so, so depression, there are things that they don't cause it, but they, they feed it. <laughs> Lack of sleep feeds it, you know, um, what you put in your body, whether or not you're exercising, those kinds of things can feed it. At first, I was just thrilled to be a mom. It's okay. I don't need to sleep. I'll get up with the baby every, <laughs> every time she cries, you know, there shouldn't be any crying, but six months of that, you know how that, <laughs> but you can't sustain life like that. You have to have sleep. You can't, you do get to a point where you're like, oh my gosh, every beck and call, every bit of my life is tied to this child. And I just mm. want to breathe for a minute, have some space for a minute. And I didn't, I didn't know that even having a baby sister, my mom had all that stuff. I just took the baby when it was fun to play dress up and doll and carry her around, you know, and I don't feel like I had, I had strong feelings of postpartum depression from the beginning. I didn't recognize it as that, but by the time she was not sleeping through the night and I was not sleeping through the night ever, nine months, especially is when I remember, cause that's when we finally did sleep training, but probably six to nine months was probably, um, the worst. So what did I recognize? Nothing during the time. In hindsight, the biggest thing for me was there was this, there was this moment, Tyler and I were supposed to go, uh, my husband, Tyler and I were supposed to go to a, uh, a basketball game with Adeline. This was going to be her first one. She was, you know, nine or 10 months old or something like that. And um, I don't remember leading up to it, how I got there. I just remember like curled up in a corner of the room and not doing well. And all Tyler could, I mean, he was like, we're going to be late. We've got to get out the door. I don't know what you're doing. Like no compassion, not no understanding. He didn't understand. I didn't understand. But, but at the time it just felt like zero compassion. 
he ended up leaving me. He he took Adeline and they left and they went to the game. And um, again, not understanding fully everything that was happening to me then, it was later in hindsight, after I had had depression again with Bethany, that I recognized for me, and, I, and I'll just say this too, everything I'm talking about today, this is my, my experience. I'm in no way saying everyone experiences this the same way, but um, for me, I almost do this test when I'm in depressed, this test with Tyler, and it is to be unkind and mean to him. And if he walks away, it's proof that I'm unlovable, that mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I'm as bad as I think I am in my mind. Um, and if he stays and takes the abuse that I'm dishing out, then, then maybe I'm, there's, a, there's a little bit of hope. Anyway, so it was going through experiences like that with Bethany that I recognized that is exactly what was happening there because he walked out the door and I just, as bad of a time as I was already having, I just sort of plummeted into very dark despair, um, not his fault. I didn't understand what's happening. He didn't understand what's happening. Um, but that is what happened to me in that moment when he walked out. That's what I, that was the main, main thing I recognized in hindsight when I acknowledged that, that, that I had had depression. Like when did those feelings start to leave? I mean, you had two other children before, before you felt that, de that severe depression again. So did the feelings leave after a certain time? It was actually um, not long after that. I'm, I would say that I no longer had depression after Adeline, by the time she was tw uh, 12 months, a year or so. So we're talking within a span of a couple of months. And, and you know, what made the difference in, in that particular case, and, and I won't say that it's been the same for all of them, but in that particular case, I, I feel like God just knew what I needed. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm very much a person that doesn't like to disappoint others. And um, I like, I'm a rule follower, like, if I don't know it's a rule, I'm fine doing it. But as soon as I find out it's a rule, I just can't. <laughs> and I'm not a good liar. Those are just things about me that I just are part of me. And at church shortly after that happened, that um, the basketball game incident happened, our Relief Society suggested that as a Relief Society, that's the women's group in our church, um, that we should all read the Book of Mormon in 60 days. I had zero desire to do this, mm. absolutely zero desire to do this, but that fear that someone was going to ask me how it was going, <laughs> that someone was going to check up on me uh, is what really got me to do it. And, and I'll be clear here that I don't think it was the reading of scripture, the act itself, that brought me out of depression. Mm. I believe that what ha helped was reading it in 60 days meant I was spending quite a bit of time in scripture on a daily basis in order to get the required number of like 10 pages or something that I needed to read. Um, and I think what helped me is that that much time reading scripture, it was in my mind. So when the negative thoughts were coming, I, I had the scripture in my mind as well. And it, for me, the depression is a, uh, it's an active fight. The negative is always there. Um, sometimes I'm a little bit stronger in the depression and I can combat it, push it away, not listen to it. And then in the really bad episodes, it is overpowering and none of the good can mm -hmm. penetrate that. Um, so I believe what helped me with Adeline was just the amount of time I was reading scripture, the truth that I kept hearing on a daily basis, I was able to recognize that and choose that when the negative entered my mind. And that process slowly tipped the scale from, from listening to the negative, which just again feeds, for me, it feeds the depression to acknowledge or accept the negative things hmm. that are running through my mind. Um, and the opposite was true for me in that in that situation that uh, as I was able to hold on to truth and actively in my mind choose to believe truth that helped me be able to kind of move out of the depressed state. Wow. And I, I want to say in a way that you know that um, I'm, I'm in no way saying just read your scriptures and say your prayers and your depression will go away because I 
I'm afraid that message is given too often and it's not as simple as that. But I do think just like not getting enough sleep feeds the depression, filling yourself with truth from God, from the scriptures, Hmm. it can help fight it and combat it. And I will mention also that that was my first negative fodder I had against myself was small compared to (laughs) after being a mother of more children for more years, um, the evidences of me being a bad mother Mm. were greater, if that makes sense, right? Mm. Um, So when I'm in that depressed, postpartum depressed state, um, the ammo of negative that I've got in my, and the evidence of that negative is greater. I can point to all the times where I have messed up, where where moms were going to mess up a lot. But um, in that state, they were exaggerated and, and harder to fight, harder to, to acknowledge that, yeah, I've messed up, but it's okay. It's normal. That's what happens. We are people and we do mess up and we aren't going to be perfect moms. Anyways, it's a harder to fight on number four, on number six, on number seven and number eight. Um, because again, a lot more evidence is against myself. Mm. Um, I also want to say that for me, postpartum depression, I, I know that some people feel the negative and the anger towards their baby, or they they can't connect with their baby. And I, I didn't feel that. I felt deep connection with my babies, and I felt um, protective of them. So any of the feelings, the non-rational anger, uh, and I'll talk about that in a second, but any feelings I had, I, they were for me in my depression towards myself. So it was my own self-harm, not my baby's self-harm. I, I may have had a couple of moments where I just wanted to shake my baby, but I, I never did. And I always, when it was at that point, it, uh, uh, it seemed to switch in me. I'd put the baby down and then just self-hate, self-loathe oh. for the fact that I'd even gotten to a point where I felt that. So, which kind of brings us into what are some signs that I had postpartum depression? How did I know between that number two and number three, I didn't have it? And how did I know on number four that I did? One of the main ones is um, easy to get angry. And I'm not talking about like a mom angry, normal situation. You know, I'm talking like it didn't match the scenario. Mm. It was extreme rage and it didn't match the scenario. And I'll also say that in all of these experiences, somewhere in the back of my mind, as I was raging, I could hear myself thinking, this is a little overdone for what happened. You know what I mean? Like it, there was that rational part of me that's like, what are you this doing? Is out of control. Yeah. Why, what are you doing? But I'll also say that it is very normal because depression isn't rational in any way, shape or form for that little voice to not last very long and to be swept aside. And so it's like you are somewhat aware that it's not, and and that helps with understanding that you have it or realizing that you have it. That understanding that the amount of rage I feel right now does not match with what the scenario that has just happened. But so that's one of my first ones is just feelings of rage over simple simple things, persistent feelings of despair and hopelessness. There's no escape, no way to change the circumstances, that things won't ever change, Um, feeling worthless, shame, guilt, that anyone could be a better mom to my kids than I am. Mm. Um, Sometimes not wanting to get out of bed or face the day, not able to maintain just basic homemaking tasks, laundry, you know, food, any part of food, shopping for it cooking it even thinking about it um often just sitting and staring into nothing just a numbness the world kind of moving around me but I'm just numb to all of it with my husband especially wanting to speak but not being able to do so it's a very strange sensation I'm not even sure if I can describe it very well but he would come and want to And this isn't in a low, low. This is just in a, like, on the verge of a low. (laughs) Um, Want to try and talk with me and understand what I'm feeling and 
and the dialogue is happening in my mind. I'm thinking about what I, what I want to say to him and I cannot get myself to speak it. And so after moments of him trying to talk to me and me not responding verbally to him, although in my mind it's going on, <laughs> I'm, I'm having conversations. I'm thinking of all the things I want to say and also conversations about just say it, just tell him, just tell him, just say it, but not actually being able to speak it. Again, I don't know unless you've experienced it, if it even makes sense for me to describe it that way, but um, often that would lead to Tyler being frustrated and walking away. And I, I've already told you about my little test that happened for him. And I don't, I, not something I consciously came up with, but just something that was an underlying test. Anytime he walked away, it was as if he were agreeing with all the things I felt about myself. Hmm. Um, and often that, that would be kind of the catalyst for a re really low episode where the onslaught of negative thoughts, mostly this is for me again, um, onslaught of negative thoughts feeding off of each other, not all the time, but often just kept slipping down into a slippier slope. Um, it would then move on to uh, self-harm. And I don't know how detailed you want me to get, but self-harm for me was- Alyssa, this is, this is just whatever you feel like comfortable sharing. Like if, if this yes. is okay for you, I, I know that what you're sharing is helpful for other people. And so, but you just do what you're comfortable with. My two main forms of self-harm. The first was depriving myself of um, basic um, necessities. Okay, uh, we lived in Utah, mid middle of winter. I would leave the house to go outside, sit on our porch swing in short sleeve shirts, taking no coat with me, not allowing myself to go back in even when I felt cold, taking away comforts like if I, I, not allowing myself to stay on the bed. And as I'm saying this, even as I'm saying it out loud right now, and I'm in a, a healthy place, um, it, it sounds silly almost, you know, it sounds silly, but it was, it was the thought process of, I'm not, I'm, I don't deserve to sleep on a bed. I should be laying on the floor. I don't, hmm. um, I'm not worth enough to go in and get a coat to get myself warm. Um, like it was all self-loathing and self-hate kind of thought. Stay outside for an hour in the winter, in the cold. Um, Tyler trying to bring me something to put on me and not accepting it or trying to bring me back in the house and refusing to go. Um, I guess wow. you could probably get the picture. Wow. <laughs> um, that and then just hitting my own head, either with my hands or against something. Um, so nothing like life threatening. So those are the only real active self-harm things that I did. Um, but I imagined other things. <laughs> if we were ever in a high place, a, a balcony or something, I could imagine how easy it would be to just fall over. Um, Melissa, did you talk to people about these feelings? I mean, you mentioned the doctor, but do you, did you ever mention these sort of things to others? Not at first. Definitely not, because I didn't want anyone to have any idea what was really happening in my head again it was a it was a sign of me my weakness a sign of how I wasn't worthy normal people didn't feel this way um and so that fear of not really wanting to let people know what was really going on but as far as like things that I think help that's probably the number one because when I first and I did not go to a therapist I didn't feel comfortable I am a big advocate of therapists at this point in my life <laughs> but at that point in my life I uh I didn't go but I did finally start talking openly to Tyler and uh, I do believe he was shocked <laughs> um when my my true thoughts that were in my mind when I started telling him a little bit about the dialogues I have with myself in my in my head and the feelings of self-harm and um and other things I think he was surprised shocked um scared not really sure what to do definitely scared yeah uh, and he's a fixer and so like 
really wanting to fix something. And he, he pushed for me to go talk to someone. And I, at that point just said, you know, I, I'm having a hard time even telling you, how am I supposed to tell a stranger that I don't know or trust? So he kind of became my place of therapy, the place where I felt like it was safe to really talk about everything that was, I was feeling. And I, I again, I think that that is so important to find at least someone that you can talk to. Um, this is skipping ahead a little too, but so it started with just him. Um, but then after Bethany was, when she, right before she turned two, we moved to Florida and I had grown up in Florida and had, they were really my mom's friends, but when I moved there as an adult with children, some of them became my friends as well. Um, and my mom, my mom no longer lived there. At, um, and we started walking together and there were some very safe people, some safe women. And so on those walks, uh, and one of them had a daughter just younger than me who was experiencing some pretty severe um, depression associated with her pregnancy. And so she started asking me questions and it was the first time I had been vulnerable with other people about what, what I had really felt. And um, I found it to be extremely healing and helpful. So I do say, talk about it. Um, and that was in Florida. And then um, I've had sisters who have experienced postpartum and that, you know, um, practice of talking to other people about it helped me be more comfortable in just being more open about it. And so I've talked to my sisters about what I really felt. And it's been healing for me in part because just recognizing that I, it was, it was alone. not just me. And then here in Indiana, um, before COVID, I had a Friday friends group. It's um, Abby Turner, who I know you've spoken to before about postpartum depression. And, uh, you know, we, we were friends before she got pregnant. We were doing this Friday group before she got pregnant and then through her pregnancy and then during her postpartum. And so mm. it became a safe place. And then um, Krista Evans, who, you know, lost her son um, to suicide that happened during the same time. And so it was just a, a good place of being able to be vulnerable with things that we were feeling where we knew it was okay to feel them and to tell the people that we were talking to what we were feeling. And so mm -hmm. I'd say that all, I guess, just to say, I do think it's really important to have a place where you can talk about what's really going on. And if anything, the only thing I was gonna tell you is my point of view, when, how I knew I had postpartum with Bethany, which is my fourth. Now, from my point of view, it's probably a little bit different than Tyler's. Uh, when I asked him how he knew, <laughs> and it's a little bit, it's still a little bit of a trigger to me to hear him even talk about it now, because he, he often would say to me when I was having kind of a episode, a, a low episode, he would, because he didn't understand what was happening, he would um, chalk it up to me being in a funk and he often used that word. Well, when you when you come out of your funk or whatever. And uh, again, this is where, when I finally was able to talk to him about things I was experiencing and telling telling him about the test, he after he knew about the test, he didn't leave me again, no matter how unkind I was being or how much I was trying to push him away. He knew it was important to me that he stay. And so he would just stay and take whatever abuse I was passing out but he didn't know that until I told him um anyway from his point of view how he knew when uh I was depressed is that I would have severe reactions to minor things which I mentioned myself um long-lasting funk <laughs> mm. that typically was triggered by an interaction and then transferred to self-loathing or um, being non-responsive and that I didn't forgive him or myself. So from his perspective, those are the things he saw and were his clues that uh, I probably needed some help that it wasn't just baby blue. Yeah, how many of your children then did you experience postpartum with? Well, I think I told you at first that it was um, first, fourth, seventh, and eighth. But then as I was 
thinking back on my experience, I distinctly remember a sitting outside the house episode <laughs> after Grace. I distinctly remember that. And I remember that probably is really where I started talking to Tyler after Beth, but I think it was a progression and I, I was more open even after Grace. And it was almost like as I recognized things, then I would tell him with Beth. So my doctor at six weeks suggested that I get on medication. And they also told me at the same time that um, sometimes the medication can increase your, it give you the energy to actually follow through on some of the negative thoughts you have or harmful thoughts you have oh, towards wow. yourself. And so they suggested that I, um, I have someone come stay with me and it wasn't possible at the time. So I packed me and the kids up and we went to Florida to live with my mom for three weeks. And while we were there, and so even just knowing that I had postpartum depression was a step in the fight against it because um, knowing at that point, I realized that I probably had had it with Adeline as well. And I recognized that reading the scriptures had helped me. And so one of the um, strategies that I had for Bethany, I went to my mom for, for help for three weeks. And then when I came back home, I just bought a bunch of cheap copies of the Book of Mormon and I had literally them laying all over my house any place I would sit to nurse or any place I would find myself plopping down and um, I'll tell you just because they're there doesn't mean you pick them up want to pick them up but because I was aware that I was fighting something it was almost like a medication that I knew I needed to take and so I would sit down and almost with disgust see the Book of Mormon there and think well, you know, that's not, that's not going to help. It's not the answer, but knowing that it probably will help because it's just like when you wake up in the morning and you start your day with prayer or you start your day with scripture study, you've got that in your mind already. And the spirit can then remind you of something you read or interject into your thoughts. It, it just is something that happens. And so hmm. I would just force myself, even if it was just one verse while I was nursing the baby to pick the book up and, and read it. Um, and I think that that was probably, you know, helpful. Again, not a cure, but something that was uh, helpful. I had a really, and I won't tell you about it in detail because it's a sacred memory of mine, but in a, in a very dark episode, I had a moment where I knew God was aware of me. I tell you about it right now. It happened with Bethany and I tell you about it now because it was impactful later when I had postpartum again. Um, it became a truth, hmm. a truth that I knew for sure. God loves me. And it was something that I used when I had postpartum with Abe and Eden, number six and seven, or seven and eight, sorry. Um, I used it. It was, it was a for sure truth. I had testimony but I had my own knowledge that God loved me and I couldn't deny that and so later when those negative thoughts would just bombard me I almost it's almost like from the Hunger Games PETA where he's doing the real and not real um you know he's, he's confused about which thoughts are real and not real and, and he's trying to sort them out um similarly the only thing I could say for truth that I know that I knew for sure was that God loves me. And so I would have a negative thought and I would just in my mind or sometimes even out loud say, God loves me. And it was, it was almost like the armor because it, it couldn't have worked if it had been something that I wasn't for sure of, because mm -hmm. if it had had any hint of, you know, like I am of worth, that would not, that phrase would not have gone anywhere. It would not have helped in any way, shape or form because I didn't believe it. It wasn't a surety. Mm. Um, and so using that to combat lies wasn't going to be helpful. But this truth that I had gained when I had postpartum with Beth, that God loves me, I was able to use that and just repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. You know, you're the worst mom. God loves me. Mm you know, you don't deserve da, 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 God loves me. And it was um, helpful. Again, there's no magic pill. It's not a fast and easy course. It is a slow and steady progress of combating 
and fighting. And for me, mostly it was the negative, the negative thoughts that as I slipped into a low episode, Satan was relentless with negative thoughts. And it, it was really very easy to believe all the things that were going through my mind. So reading scripture to help insert something other than negative and that statement, God loves me, as I was sorting through what is truth and what is not truth, um, were helpful. I've already touched on having good friends. That was very difficult for me. I had no friends, real friends in Utah. I felt very alone. Uh, we were close to family, so my mom came to help once a week. Tyler's dad would stop by and help. And, and that part was helpful, but I was, I was so lonely. I didn't feel like I could be myself or let anyone know. And, and in all honesty, I'd moved there when I was already pregnant. We moved to Utah. And I don't know how you are when you're pregnant, Shayla, but I'm a different person when I'm pregnant than when I'm not pregnant. Just the fact that I don't have any energy, you know, I just, everything takes more effort. I, the person, you know, we play volleyball once a week. We have good conversations that person wasn't the same person that moved to Utah. And so I moved there pregnant. I didn't like anyone got to know me ever while I was there. And I just didn't make any close connections or friends. I was pregnant, had a baby. When the baby was five months old, I got pregnant again wow. and had another baby. And so, and I, and also the depression re really hard for me to differentiate the depression with Eden and Abe because it really was almost like one big long depression there was no real stop to it I just ended up pregnant again and had another baby and it just um kind of escalated I think I was talking about things that helped with Beth medication not Zoloft I don't even remember which one it got on but I know I went to the doctor twice they put me on something I wasn't happy about it. I knew by then you can ask for something different and I got on something different and it and it was helpful another thing just back to the support with Beth, I was trying to be more open and talk to more people. And um, after I'd got back from my mom's, or maybe it was before, it probably was before, because we blessed Bethany at our church very early when she was very, very young. And I think it was before I ever went to my mom's, probably about the same time I decided to get on medication, and but hadn't quite gotten on or somewhere in there um we had a bunch of people over my sister tyler's sister well two sisters we had a teenage sister 15 year old living with us um she was it was to help her but it was also helpful to me then my sister and tyler's sister came and their families and everything and as you can imagine when you're dealing with postpartum you don't really want to be around people anyways. And all these people were now in my home. It was very stressful, it was overwhelming. And uh, it got to a point where I just needed to be, I did, just needed to walk away. And so I just handed Bethany to um, Amber, which is Tyler's sister, 15 year old who was living with us. She'd, she'd been there since she was born and she knew our like routines and she knew what she needed. And I felt like I could just pass her over and not worry about her. And I just went in my room and, and it curled up on my bed and my sister and also my sister-in-law and and even amber she gave the baby to tyler and they just came in and they just got on the bed with me and kind of just laid by me and curled around me and didn't say anything they didn't ask me anything they just that show of support and unconditional love you feel alone and it's really important to know that you're not alone yeah that's that's pretty much all for bethany and then so then with abe and eden i took all the things that i'd learned and uh tried to incorporate those and then with abe and eden that undeniable truth that god loves me i added that to my arsenal a little bit and something else i did i made a choice not to nurse them um and i had nursed all my babies but i knew I tried nursing Eden, I brought her home. She's number seven I, and I brought her home and I tried to do what I'd done with everybody else, but I had teenagers. I had a child in high school and I had two middle schoolers and I had, um, 
they had places to be and I had to run around and, and uh, the thought of trying to have this baby on a schedule, which I also knew was essential, getting my babies to sleep through the night early, I knew was essential at, from experience. Um, the sooner I was able to get more sleep, the faster I could heal. And it wasn't just sleep. I, you know, it, there are things that not, not getting enough sleep, not getting any exercise, the things that add to the depression for me, number one was getting my babies on a routine and getting them to sleep through the night. That's just what I knew I needed. So I tried nursing her for about two weeks and it wasn't, it wasn't going well at all. And I was very stressed about it. And I would, was trying to coordinate her nursings in between when someone needed to be picked up. And I mean, the whole thing was just, it became overwhelming. And I knew I was already, I already knew I was depressed or going to be experiencing postpartum depression because I had already felt a lot of mm. the rage, the other things. And, um, and I made a decision to put her on a bottle. And then, you know, at five months, I got pregnant again with Abe. And um, when he was born, I put him on a bottle from the beginning. And it, it all really came down to things that I knew I needed to help me combat the dep depression. Um, and it was difficult for me. I'd nursed all my babies, but uh, I do think it was the right decision to help. So that was something that was a little different with Ava and Eden. Melissa, and did you get right on a medication then with Eden and Abe? Were you on medication throughout that? Um, I didn't get on immediately with Eden. Um, you know, it had been, I had had two more babies. <laughs> And I didn't get on medication with Grace, even though I experienced a little bit there. I didn't get on medication with her. And I think in my mind, I thought, I know how to do this now. I know the things I need to do to try and help me. I don't need to get on the medication. Um, and so I didn't get on it with Abe, with Eden. And I wasn't on it through my pregnancy with Abe. It was probably a mistake to not get on it after Eden, but I, I got on it pretty, pretty immediately after I had Abe. So what I do different with Abe and Eden. Um, one other thing is my, I had a sister who was into oils and she mixed up all kinds of blends that might help me for me and gave me samples of them for me to try. And, um, and from that, I will say there was one, it was supposed to be one that was like to reduce stress, but every time I used it, it just made me fall asleep and it became <laughs> the miracle worker. I, I got to the point where I was only using it at night because I couldn't afford to sleep during the day as much as it was making me tired. But I got to the point where I religiously time for bed, put the oil on because I knew I needed, I needed what sleep I could get and I needed to sleep um, hard. I still use that oil. It's just the blend that worked well for me. I don't know that it works for everyone, but it was the magic sleeping blend for me. What um, is the blend? Do you remember? Like, do you remember what it's called? Um, yeah. What? I won't be able to recall it now that you're asking. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll think of it in just a second. All right. um, the biggest impact for me uh, with helping me um, with the, the depression for Abe, which lasted from the time he was born a full year, maybe even a little bit over a year. And that was uh, our move to Indiana. And I think the reason that helped me, there was a couple of things. Number one, I, I got friends immediately when I moved here. Um, I just felt connected to people immediately. And Nicole Hackler brought over Thanksgiving turkey. She didn't even know me you know, and just, I just felt genuinely cared about by people who didn't know me and that was helpful. And then the second thing was that it was a fresh start. Um, told you, I felt like I just sort of pigeonholed in Utah. Like I didn't, nobody really got to know me. I didn't have any friends. I was just sort of alone. And um, in moving here, I was like, I, I do not want that to happen to me again. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I just decided that one thing I was going to do when we got here, one thing I was going to do differently than what I had been doing um, is to do service. Before we moved to Utah, we would have people over to our home and I would feed them dinner 
almost every Sunday just to get to know them, just to be friends with them. And we hadn't done that literally almost the entire time we were in Utah. We had not had people over for Sunday dinner. And part of it was I couldn't handle it. But part of it was we tried asking when we first got there and everyone had family dinners or things that they were doing. And so anyways, I uh, when we moved here, I thought that's something that I want to do again. I just want to do service and for me it was a little bit like that first experience with Adeline of reading reading the scriptures I'm not saying it was the cure thing I'm not saying go out and do service and it will cure you I'm saying for me where I was in that moment I was already over a year into the depression I'd been implementing all the strategies I knew trying to get better sleep and and I was still struggling with it a little bit and uh and this was the thing that was kind of the catalyst for helping me. And I don't know when we met, if you thought to yourself, well, that lady's depressed or not, or if you never even hinted at it, but I was still depressed when we moved here. Hmm. And shortly after that, I was able to get off the medication, but I was also very focused on um, other people. It almost like gave me a distraction and it was, it was the last thing I needed for, for this last time to kind of help me be able to heal from the depression. Now it's interesting, Melissa, because my, I do remember my first impression of you and it was this woman is so service oriented, like your whole family, like you, you guys came and helped us clear away all those pine trees, like the forest that we had to chop down in our backyard. Like I couldn't believe how much service you guys pitched in to do. And that seems to be, that you were the motivator behind that. Well, it, it, like I was trying to mention about the PETA thing, it, the depression, it's like, a, it's a fight that you're in and you have to daily fight and daily choose to discard negative thoughts that are coming into your mind and daily choose. To, and, and it's not a passive thing that you're like, oh yeah, I just, oh, well, that's, that's not true. It's a, like convincing yourself that's, not truth i know god loves me i know it's hard to believe right now that i'm worth anything but i know that this is the truth and i'm just gonna have to Hmm. hold on to it until i can believe it and i think for me the service was the same thing it was a i'm gonna choose to say yes to everything and you know that sounds like burnout but we didn't have any obligations here you know like it was a clean slate we were starting fresh ask me now if i could do right now in my life what I did when we first moved here there's just no way my it's way too packed and filled with the stuff we filled it with but when we moved here we hadn't filled it with anything nobody had extracurricular things at that point you know it was we didn't have callings at church it was just Hmm. it was just a fresh start and so I made a conscious choice to whether I felt like doing it at the time or not I was just gonna say yes the sign up came around I was just gonna sign up I heard about someone who needed something, I was just gonna go. And it was it was a strategy I was using with myself to fight hmm. the desire to curl up on my bed and not do anything. It was a conscious choice I was making and it was forcing myself sometimes to, to go out and do something that I didn't necessarily wanna do. And I'll say, I, I've used that also with um, Relief Society activities that I really don't wanna go to. And I talk myself through walking out the door and I talk myself into putting the keys in the car and I talk myself into driving to the church and I talk myself into leaving the parking lot and I talk Mm -hmm. myself into going into the church. And I don't necessarily have an earth shattering time, but at the end, it feels like an accomplishment. I did it when I really wanted to just stay home. And those things help me. They help me not just curl up and cry but I acknowledge that it's hard it's a fight it's not I don't say that lightly like it was just 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 change your mind just do something different you can fight your depression I it was just something that I had that I knew would help me if I would choose to do it so when it comes to encouraging others I think you've mentioned a lot of things that helped you is is there anything else that you want to add to it just encouragement of that it is a fight and you fight better when you're not doing it alone. 
also talk to someone. You'll have a hard time feeling the spirit or feeling like God cares about you. And when you get down on your knees to pray, you'll feel nothing. And you'll wonder if God's even hearing your prayers. I just want to tell you that he is. Just pray anyways, even if you don't feel like he's listening. He hasn't left you. He's still there. There's just this big fog and you can't see him and you can't feel him. But the fog will lift as you start healing from the depression and you'll realize that he never left and he was always there. I think that was probably one of the hardest things for me is feeling like a God that I believed in my whole life didn't care when I needed him the most. And it's just not true. Depression covers and skews the truth. I guess that's it. He doesn't leave you. Keep praying anyways. Keep reading your scriptures anyways. Even if it doesn't feel like they're making a difference. I love that. Melissa, thank you. I, I'll i add my two cents of just keep going and just keep learning. And we impact others when we are willing to share what experience we have and grow from them. I think you have a really good point of none of us are alone similar feelings, even though I don't know if I've ever experienced depression to the extent you were saying, those experiences would have helped me in my own challenges, in my own afterbirth, or even in my own depressions of not even related to, to postpartum. Thanks, Melissa. We're going to sign off and encourage everyone to just keep learning.